Hi, good morning. So, <laughs> morning. Are you enjoying Asia Blockchain Summit? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So, I'm also. I was so excited to debate this morning, and I'm my the moderator for this session. Uh, nowadays, I feel the mass adoption of blockchain has progressed. In case of Japan, blockchain game is rapidly becoming very popular. And for example, my crypto hero is one of the most famous blockchain game in Japan. And as this example showed, the interest in in blockchain in Japan is becoming bigger and bigger. Uh, this might be the reason why there are most uh, more Japanese speakers at this conference. Uh, but to think about the whole world, blockchain is still far away from mass adoption. Uh, Bitcoin bought in 2009, and 2019 is the 10th anniversary for Bitcoin. And now, many people are trying to spare this technology to real world. In this session, I'm going to figure out what is the missing link of mass adoption of blockchain. Uh, by exploring this theme, I want speakers to share the idea of what is necessary to solve this missing link. How are they trying to solve it right now and what the society will be the future with uh, blockchain. In order to make this session as valuable as possible, I invited the people working hard to realize the mass adoption of blockchain in the front line. So I want you all to introduce yourself uh, from Lily, please. Uh, my name is Lily Liu. Um, I had a company called Earn.com, which we sold to Coinbase last year. I'm now an angel investor, uh, do advisor in the space, um, and, uh, uh, and I've been in crypto for a number of years. Bobby. Hey guys, uh, my name is Bobby. I'm co-founder of Crypto.com. So we are a cryptocurrency payment platform. You guys can think of us as a bank for cryptocurrency users. Our pro product portfolio including uh, a Visa card where you can spend cryptocurrency anywhere Visa accepted worldwide. We also have a robot advisor for crypto invest. We also offer cryptocurrency user uh, crypto earn where you can earn a, up to 8% crypto. We also have the crypto credit for lending. Um, our headquarters is in Hong Kong. Uh, we have uh, 150 people right now working on you know, the service for cryptocurrency users. Hi everyone, my name is Benny. I am the founding team member of CryptoKitties. Our parent company is called Dapper Labs. It's based in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, we're about 110 employees now, uh, and half of the company is focusing on forming a studio. We're working with Hollywood studios, gaming companies, uh, celebrities, and sports leagues to build uh, blockchain games. So that's really exciting. We're fusing creativity and blockchain technology uh, and making it accessible to uh, the mainstream audience. And then kind of the second initiative of the company is around building technology. Uh, we have a background in the last six years building successful enterprise SaaS businesses. Uh, the two companies that we've spun out are profitable and self-funded. The first one's called Zenhub, the second one's called Routific, and they're both in Vancouver, Canada as well. Uh, and so the other initiative for Dapper Labs is around technology, and we built our own wallet called Dapper Wallet. It's taken about eight or nine months, and I'm sure there will be a, a question later on to talk more about Dapper, but uh, we're the combination of creativity and fun uh, and playfulness, and also uh, building technology that will be used by millions of people. Hi everyone, I'm Shin He Lee, and by the way, uh, we uh, met, so Mai and Benny, we met uh, at the speaker's dinner the other day, and then we realized we are uh, very matching, <laughs> so we decided that we are going to be the brightest panel of this uh, summit or conference. Um, so I'm Shin He Lee, I'm a founding partner of GBIC and Block72. 
And GBIC is a global crypto fund. Uh, we started investing in this space from 2016. Uh, over 50 different companies, and one of uh, them uh, is uh, Dapper Labs <laughs> or Crypto Kitties. Uh, and Block72 is uh, GBIC's uh, consulting arm. So we are based in US, China, and Korea, and we think that these three markets are the most important market for the crypto and blockchain space. So through Block72, we want to help projects uh, on their uh, go-to strategies uh, for this market. Thank you. Thank you for the amazing panelist. And the first question is to Bobby. And so, in my opinion, most people are not familiar with crypto. For example, wallet, uh, private key, and crypto.com has created a bridge to mass adoption by allowing card payment that everyone is already using. I think by crypto.com, uh, crypto holders are motivated to use crypto by giving them airdrop or cashback by the collaboration to Netflix or Spotify. I want to know which user layer is using crypto.com the most and uh, what is the challenge you are facing now and what is the strategy for future user expansion yeah so as i said uh, you guys can think of us as a bank for cryptocurrency users so in other words so most of our user base is uh you know retail customer rather than the, the traders uh, I think right now the most challenging thing is building a global payment network is uh, extremely difficult. Uh, I think uh, I think it will take uh, you know five to ten years to build a global payment network. But uh, uh, as the co-founder of Crypto.com, uh, we are confident. Right now we are bringing you know one million users and ten million merchants uh, into this space to accept crypto. I think um, this is uh, the, uh, this is what can contribute the most to this industry is to make the pie much bigger, bigger and bigger. Um, what's the last question? Uh, well, last uh, question is uh, the future uh, strategy for future user expansion. So our approach is very similar to those successful payment company uh, like Alipay. Um, we understand. Uh, to bring more users to this cryptocurrency space, we need uh, two elements. So first off is a user-friendly um, user fr the, the user -friendly, uh, app to, for the user to easy to use. The second is the financial incentives, like uh, what Alipay did for the Chinese customer. So for us, we, we offer up to 5% cashback uh, for all the user to use cryptocurrency debit card. We also offer up to 8% return on crypto so the, without those financial incentives it's very difficult to bring the users into this space yeah thank you so if you don't ha have uh, crypto.com yet so you can download the you can see the qr code back of the sheet so let's download it <laughs> And now, so uh, Bobby shared about the knowledge of the service. And the next question is to Benny because so the your dapper is very inno innovative for me. And so I think it is very innovative that the user is able to recover their wallet because uh, they don't own their private key. Also, people don't need to pay gas fee. So uh, these points change my stereotype imagine of crypto wallet. And so I want to ask you one thing. After the launch of Dapper, is there any difference to the user layer of kitties? And also, did Lapa bring new user to this industry? Thanks for the question. CryptoKitties, when we launched, it was the world's first blockchain game. To date now, there's been thousands of games, blockchain games that have been developed. Most of it, unfortunately, is in the gambling space. Uh, and there has been hundreds of millions of dollars in volume. Um, we also created the NFT standard, the ERC721, that has opened the door for an kind of parallel thinking of what is possible beyond payments in, in currency. Uh, what about art? What about collectibles? Um, and we spend a lot of time thinking about the future uh, in regards to the metaverse. Um, 
there's a really interesting presentation from the CEO of Magic Leap that talks about all of these different layers that stack up and build up uh, this digital world that could exist. And so for us, when we launched CryptoKitties, the one thing that we've been really focusing on uh, are the users. Uh, we've got so many emails and tweets from you know moms and dads and uncles and aunts who you know talked to us and wrote us a letter and saying like, hey, you know, like my son kept talking about Bitcoin or kept talking about all of these you know uh, cryptocurrencies but I just never understood it. it just makes no sense like why would I use this as payment why would I, I just use Visa and the turning point was that you know CryptoKitties in some ways is the mascot for uh, Ethereum or for the blockchain uh, it's accessible and we've gotten a lot of amazing feedback from the moms and dads who are like hey you know like I made my first transaction using MetaMask and that was the experience in 2017 near the end of that uh, and we're so lucky that we have an amazing community uh, the game is still thriving the community is continually building amazing uh, applications on top of CryptoKitties, that's what we call the Kittyverse. And so about eight or nine months ago, we started working on our new wallet. Uh, we actually had the chance to speak with a range of different products that are available in the market, and we were very open to using them because at the time, um, as you know, MetaMask was the alternative, was the option, the only option for us. Um, but through about four or five months of engineering and development, what we've realized is that Currently in this space, there's a spectrum of wallets, right? There's a wallet where you own the private key or the seed words, and when you lose it, it's game over. You lose everything, right? And that's a big problem because um, a lot of the, U the UI, UX paradigms for traditional web apps uh, you know, the number one used feature is forget my password. And, you know, you don't have that option. When you lose your keys, you lose everything. And then this kind of other spectrum of wallets is custodian wallets where uh, you have exchanges or even services now that are using HSMs or hardware security modules that provide bank level security. But at the end of the day, it's still a database that is secured between very thick walls and electricity needs to run in and somebody needs to pay the bills. So custodian solutions aren't the right way to go about it as well. So with Dapper, we built a smart contract wallet. Um, being that uh, on Ethereum, you know, smart contracts allow for programmability. Uh, for CryptoKitties, there's three smart contracts that have the genetics and the breeding and everything, the gameplay. We thought like, hey, why don't we just create a smart contract for every single person here uh, when you create a wallet, and that allows for fraud detection, chargeback prevention, uh, allows for a lot of flexibility. Uh, in this space, I think people call it multi-signature or multi-sig, uh, but what we call it is a smart wallet. And we spent about three, four months doing user research with the CryptoKitties users who are actually paying um, you know, and playing the game, and they have a lot of feedback. And we took away things like the concept of or even the word gas, we call it network fees, and a lot of amazing new UI uh, that just makes it really extremely smooth. And the last thing is that uh, it will be multi-platform. So for the user experience, it's username, password, and you can access it anywhere on any device. If you pour water on your computer, don't worry about it. Uh, if you saved your private key or whatever from other wallets, uh, that, in that scenario, you would be freaking out. Uh, but you could actually regenerate the keys, the key pairing on new devices. So it's by far the perfect balance of a technical architecture that is decentralized, the best UI UX, and also the partnerships around payment rails. Uh, and so that's the Dapper wallet that we've been working on, and it comes from a lot of experience working with uh, the players of CryptoKitties. So what we've seen is uh, a huge, tremendous feed feedback uh, from the community, and they really enjoy the experience. Uh, we've been working with the top 10 blockchain games like Decentraland, Ethereum, uh, and all of them actually have adopted Dapper, same with OpenSea, because it's the best solution. And currently, right now, we're subsidizing all of the gas for the users who are using, who are playing these games. So uh, it's just made the, the user experience 10 times better than anything that's out there currently for people who want to actually uh, interact with the blockchain and play a game. Just on a side uh, story, so we hosted a meetup uh, for CryptoKitties uh, in Korea. It was, what, January this year? And again, at that time, it was like cold, cold, severe cold uh, cryptocurrency blockchain winter. So everyone was not happy. But after the meetup, some people actually came to me and say, 
I'm so sad whenever I look at my uh, wallet and my exchange account, but whenever I look at my crypto kitties and there were no new kittens were born, it actually gives a lot of pleasure. So <laughs> I mean, bringing like the user uh, excitement and entertainment uh, is a great way for the mass adoption, I think. <laughs> Thank you. The kitties are cute. <laughs> Yeah, so the Vinny is a pioneer of blockchain game, and also the uh, I totally changed the imagine of the stereotype of the uh, wallet. So you also pioneer of the new style wallet. So this is very amazing, and so the so Shinhei, uh, the next question is to you, and so you have seen business transformation in entre. Uh, enterprises and uh, disruptive changes in startups. And uh, what do you think, uh, which side is more important for the mass adoption of blockchain? Got it. So the question, that's a great question. So uh, whether the big corporates versus startups are, are more uh, important uh, for the mass adoption. So the cost of um, technological development has gone down very significantly. And also, there are, like, the, the way that we express ourselves and communication uh, have been very decentralized or democratized. And blockchain being very decentralized and also uh, very community-driven, I think the chance or the opportunities for small startups uh, can catch a lot of opportunities uh, is actually are, are actually going up and we see this trend not only in the blockchain but also many other area of technological development such as Uber uh, really disrupt the how we think about the transportation Spotify and um, a lot of other uh, startups have been doing that but when we talk about mass mass adoption, I think uh, the big corporates uh, need to, and they have to play very important roles. So big corporates, what they have, they have access to massive capital. They already have trusted brand. They have really good uh, relationship with some of uh, their core users, and they have a lot of users who are using their services uh, already. So we, if we don't uh, leverage those assets that the big corporates are using, I think it's going to be hard for the blockchain to realize the true mass adoption. So stepping back, what does the mass adoption mean to me? So for me, I think mass adoption is when everyone has the cryptocurrency wallet address. So when you need to send money, even the company, when they need to pay you um, the salary, Instead of like uh, they are asking you the bank account, they're gonna ask you the, what's your cryptocurrency wallet address, right? Just like everyone here uh, has their email address to send the information to each other. So for example, my mom, uh, she doesn't know how to create uh, the cryptocurrency wallet. Uh, she never used MetaMask and uh, she doesn't know how to save private key <laughs> and it's gonna be really really big barrier for her to do that but when samsung uh, start having the cryptocurrency wallet within their uh, mobile galaxy s and i'm korean so my mom used uh, kakao which is like the most popular messaging app in korea when kakao start invading uh, the all the uh, characteristic and then they start having individual wallet embedded uh, in the kakao messenger app and mom start just um, using and start having the cryptocurrency wallet while she's just doing whatever she is doing right now. And I think that's the main uh, and mass adoption. So in conclusion, I think uh, we need to collaborate because uh, the startups are very nimble. So they are really good at finding uh, technological opportunity and then product market fit. But they, need, they also need uh, some resources to scale to the mass adoption level. Thank you, Shinhei. 
and Lily. <laughs> Actually, so when launched Arn.com, there were almost no services uh, accepting crypto. So I was so excited with your service, and I'm honored to meet Lily this time. And so I want to know your so if you have any comment about our uh, the, the topic. So please, yeah. I'm um, sure. Well, I think that. Um you know, we've been talking about mass adoption for a really long time, and probably where we are is 50, 60 million uh, individual holders, and that's you know just a guesstimate um, of folks in crypto, um, and predominantly in Bitcoin, I'm going to guess as well. Um, so, you know, what what's most important is to think about why should this matter for a billion people, um, and uh, and that can happen one of two ways. It's either because you can get something really great, or you can avoid something really bad. Um, and so, you know, there's kind of uh, primitive versions of both of those things happening right now. Getting something really good is to be able to make 20x on your money. Uh, and let's be honest, the sort of ability to make money online is something that uh, appeals a lot to and probably to the majority of those 50 million people. Um, and, uh, and then the other narrative that you probably hear very often um, is the narrative around privacy and censorship resistance. Uh, and the avoidance of potentially really bad things happening if you have full transparency into your financial, uh, into your financial life and uh, and all of the sort of downstream effects of that. Um, so you know, to me, um, in sort of the upside case, uh, what this is really about is uh, is the potential to uh, to sort of you know build um, a new uh, economy in the digital world, right? Um, we already sort of spend increasing amount of time of our lives, um, of our, our sort of mind share and, uh, and you know, of our wallet share um, in some form, even if not completely in the digital world, and yet it's still tethered to you know, one of probably 200 different currencies depending on where you live. Um, and there are, certain, uh, there are certain sort of frictions and all of that. Now when we thought about, when we thought about um, Earn, um, you know, the inspiration was you know, every time there's a new technology that comes along, if it's useful, um, it's because um, it's enabling a new market, right? If you think about the internet originally it sort of created entirely new markets and the ability to monetize the long tail of individuals, both as content consumers and content creators, and the ability to monetize individual transactions down to a click, down to a page view, uh, and down to these sort of uh, uh, almost infinitesimal uh, little actions. Um, and then if you think about sort of the mo mobile phone and how transformative that was, it enabled these entirely new markets to form where you could sort of have individuals act as both drivers and riders and clear those markets, which is pretty amazing in real time. Um, and so when we thought about sort of what are these markets that you can create um, with cryptocurrency, now that you've got money running in one direction, what's going to be sold in the other direction, there actually right now aren't that many things that people actually want to go spend crypto on because most of the things people think about buying um, have a physical supply chain before and after, and therefore our volatility is sort of very sensitive, right? Um, but when we thought about Earn, basically we were helping people sell their spare time, and no one knows what their minute rate is. And it feels free to people, so they're basically pretty happy to pick up some almost free money. Uh, and that was pretty interesting to us um, from a perspective of sort of building a product and a service that can resonate today um, with potentially a large number of people because everyone's got free time and everyone kind of likes free money. Yeah, thank you. And so the, uh, one more question the, uh, to Lily. Uh, currently, we have discussed about the uh, importance of design of UX and uh, almost uh, especially regulation, and I think most people uh, here are exhausted with this topic. So since I believe for real problem solving, start thinking from new perspective is very important. Could you share any other perspective with uh, than UX or regulation we have missed? Um, well, um, I think that um uh, because this sort of uh, these digital economies they move between borders fairly uh, quickly, I think what you've already seen from the beginning and what you're going to continue to see is that um, you know water falls, uh, water flows downhill, um, and so there's enough countries. In fact, we're sitting in Taiwan right now for a reason uh, because I think uh, my perspective that Taiwan sees an opportunity um, to actually see be one of these sort of physical anchor points for uh, for you know a, a a growing digital economy, um, uh, and sees you know potentially competitive advantage there because uh, it's not the sort of underwriter or the dom denominator of the U.S. dollar, right? Uh, and therefore doesn't have a lot of, uh, a lot to lose by sort of supporting this ecosystem, and in fact has potentially a lot to gain 
um, by being sort of one of these tether points, um, no pun intended, for, for what's probably a growing ecosystem. Um, so I think that that is, uh, that is uh, very positive. Um, and, uh, and I think that that um, is, you know, it's, it's obviously going to go in sort of uh, fits and starts. Um, but that is something that sort of gives um, uh, a lot of optionality to folks. Now, um, I understand that not all of that typically sort of um, looks right from day one, uh, doesn't necessarily smell right. There's a lot of false starts. Um, uh, but that's partially because, you know, innovation is a... Um, is not always a very clean process. And one of the challenges that we have in crypto is all of that drama, right, which exists in all of these small companies, um, all of that is being played out publicly from day one. Um, and so it might not actually be that much more dramatic, but it certainly looks like that because it's on social media, um, everything's being talked about in channels of hundreds, if not thousands of people, you don't really know who's listening. Um, but uh, I think it's important to sort of realize that that perception is not actually, um, uh, uh, you know, reflective of much more exaggerated reality. Yeah, thank you. And we have uh, eight minutes. So the this uh, event, this uh, event, um, everyone, not everyone, but or most of people discussing about the Libra. And so nowadays, many people discuss about Libra launched by Facebook. And since this might bring Facebook users to blockchain ecosystem, and what is your opinion about the influence of Libra? Uh, so I want to know the everyone. Um, I think it's great for Bitcoin. Um, I think it's probably not so great for central banks um, and or uh, um, or banking institutions. Um, in fact, uh, just this morning there was an announcement from the House Financial Committee, uh, the Democrat-run sort of House uh, Financial Committee, that actually said in there, "We understand. Please, essentially, a cease and desist letter to Facebook, um, and saying, you know, we understand you're trying to uh, uh, you're trying to sort of propose an alternate global financial system based in Switzerland. We don't like that, right?" Uh, so they're calling them out exactly for sort of what the grand aspiration is. Um, so, you know, on one hand, um, I think it really says a lot for, um, you know, one of the most powerful institutions um, in our current world to at least seem to sort of endorse something that sounds a little bit like blockchain, right? That's great for sort of mainstream press coverage, even though it really in no way, shape, or form competes with Bitcoin. Um, so I think it's universally good. Um, and if uh, Libra actually sort of comes to fruition because I think what was announced is a little bit more of like a pregnancy announcement than a birth announcement. Uh, so if they actually sort of launch, um, then uh, then it's pretty powerful competition for uh, for the U.S. dollar um, first and foremost, uh, and potentially other uh, other currencies as well. Yeah, I, th I think it's a very good for this industry. Um, uh, crypto, uh, we co-founded a company, Crypto.com, in 2016. Uh, when we did our white paper and we, when we did the ICO in 2017, right? I think everyone here never gonna think of Facebook gonna write a white paper and potentially have a coin, right? Uh, in 2019, and more and more company in the U.S. probably will follow the trend and and, and have the white paper and issue coin to join this, you know, blockchain cryptocurrency family. So this is a very, very good thing for, 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 the, for the cryptocurrency industry. And I think uh, a company with a coin is, is a trend uh, in the next five to, ten, five to 10 years. We see the friction every single day with people who have cryptocurrency and want to play a game. Um, there are solutions out there that allow the acceptance of multiple different cryptocurrencies, but it does not really solve the problem. If we're talking about um, the adoption of these platforms that are decentralized, which is blockchain, uh, games have always been at the forefront of that. Um, games brought uh, the about 50 to 70 percent of the uh, new audiences to Facebook, um, particularly Farmville in the early days. So in order for us to bootstrap and have mass adoption for new platforms, uh, we need 
to have games. And in order to have games, we need to have accessibility uh, on the payment side. So I think that Facebook will do a, a great job, or not Facebook, Libra will do a great job in making that accessible, making uh, the, the coin to be used uh, across border. For us, I think that we would imagine accepting that and allowing players to have the choice to use whichever cryptocurrency or currency that they, they so choose. Uh, and for us, we think that, uh, it, you know, along with this, I think they're going to do a really great job in one of the core problems, which is mass education. Um, they're going to, they have access to a lot of people and they could teach them and kind of train them. A lot of the games right now or a lot of dApps have to spend, you know, a ton of resources on tutorials and educational materials that repeat over and over, over the same thing about what is Bitcoin, how to use Bitcoin, what is Ethereum. And, um, you know, in the market right now, there's a lot of fragmentation. Each company is kind of leveraging educational resources like videos or, or content in order to educate, do the same thing basically over and over again. Uh, but I do think that creating a baseline of education, creating a global payment uh, will allow for more dApps and more blockchain games and entertainment to exist, of which I think will have real application and real value for people. Yeah, I think uh, there are um, many different uh, ways to look into um, Global Coin or Libra. But because our topic is mass adoption, I want to approach from the mass adoption perspective. So what really takes to bring mass adoption of the new technology? So number one, I think is it, um, is it providing a clear and recognizable use case for a common problem? So if you uh, have read the uh, Libra white paper, they say their mission is becoming a global uh, currency and financial infrastructure for unprivileged people. So what does that mean? How many people are unbanked in the world? Uh, sitting here uh, in Taipei, which is a very uh, developed country, we probably don't know, but there are almost two billions of people globally right now are unbanked. So if you can transfer money, which is value, which has value, without going through uh, the bank accounts, it's, it's, uh, it's a breakthrough, right? So right now, if you want to send me the messages or even pictures, you don't need to get permission. You just need to like WeChat me, WhatsApp me, or Facebook Messenger me, and just uh, iMessage me. But if you right now, if you want to send money, you have to go open a bank account. And there are two billions of people who still don't have the access to the bank. So number one, I think the Facebook Libra is uh, clearly having great use cases. Number two, is it easily accessible, right? So right now, uh, you can access Facebook or Instagram uh, anywhere, everywhere, uh, if you have internet and the smartphone. Uh, not even smartphone, if you're a desktop, you can also access. And can can people do that? Yes, right? And even like Facebook is uh, investing or spending lots of money to make the internet accessible for people around the world. Number three, uh, is it going to be cheap and free? And I think the Facebook is going to make it almost cheap or free uh, to transfer values between uh, users. So yes. Number four, does it have a wide brand awareness? Yeah, like um, some people probably don't know um, country, I, I don't know, like Malta or Estonia, but people know what Facebook and Instagram are, right? So they have the grand brand awareness globally. So coming from like the mass adoption perspective, Facebook, Libra, it's definitely a great thing. Uh, and like, I mean, we understand that it's gonna take a lot of time and efforts and resources to overcome some regulation uh, and regulatory uh, problem, right? But from even the U.S. government perspectives, what they can do, right? Number one, they can totally go against like Facebook and trying to put them down. 
Number two, they can't, even though probably they don't really like the idea, but they have to work with them and collaborate with them. And number one, I think, um, I like the quote say, uh, barring uh, divine, uh, like different ways, like uh, innovation cannot be stoppable. And I think if you start Facebook, there are gonna be other countries, other big corporates in the world are trying to uh, approach the problem in a similar way. So I think from like rational perspective, I think US government has to find a way to collaborate with these big corporates. And it again, like Facebook is just smart or Libra is smart. They say it's not only Facebook, but they have like alliance of big corporates, right? So I think from US government, if they cannot stop the trend, they have to find a way to work with it. With, for example, I'm just making up, but probably they're going to ask Libra to increase the percentage of USD reserve because they say they're going to uh, have the seven different currency or more currency to, in their reserve. So probably they're going to ask, like, hey, at least you have like a percentage of USD, for example. So I think even from the regulation perspective, uh, I think uh, the governments and the big corporates start realizing that it's uh, almost a trend that they cannot stop so they will find the way to uh, get the most out of it thank you see and thank you or or and so i believe so <laughs> sorry <laughs> time is over and so i believe uh, today's session was very valuable uh, thank you thank you so much <laughs>